So, you want to save the world with clean energy? Make money doing it? Confused about the economic and technical realities of residential and commercial solar, batteries, heat pumps, EVs? Want the real world scoop on new energy technologies, not manufacture hype? Then tune in to the Weekly Energy Show, hosted by Barry Cinnamon. Insights from Barry's 40 plus years in the solar and energy industry will help you understand the future ways we'll generate and consume energy. And now, here's Barry. Welcome to this week's Energy Show. So, regarding global warming, are we doomed? Or are there practical paths towards worldwide decarbonization and limiting the impact of global warming? So, I'm an optimist. Otherwise, I wouldn't be in the solar business for over 40 years. There's a fairly clear path forward. There's political risk going down this path, and there's definitely winners and losers. And economics, at the end of the day, will drive these solutions. The problem is economics take a while to kind of filter through to these political decisions. I mean, you have incumbent fossil fuel industries that are making billions and billions of dollars, and they can pretty effectively out-lobby the alternatives, the renewables, the electrification guys. But eventually that'll change. So the answer is yes, we can mostly get there. And I'm going to kind of jump ahead right now to the end, to what we need to do. And then we're going to kind of drill down and you'll understand why I came to these conclusions. So we need to do three key things. First, pedal to the metal on deploying practical solutions right now. The longer we wait, the worse the problem gets. So on the energy consumption side, we need to electrify everything. And the reason why we need to electrify everything is we can generate clean energy from renewable sources with zero greenhouse gas emissions. So we need to electrify everything that consumes energy on the planet. Not easy to do. But, you know, in terms of transportation, electric vehicles, heat pumps, energy efficiency, plenty of generation from wind and solar and storage with batteries and hydro and geothermal. These technologies work and they're scalable and they're cost effective. When I use that term, it means they are just as cheap or cheaper than the alternatives. Maybe not at the beginning, but you make that upfront investment and you're going to save money down the road, just like solar. Yeah. It's cheaper to keep buying electricity from utility forever. But if you invest in a rooftop solar system or batteries or whatever, it costs a little bit of money up front, but then you're going to save a lot of money down the road. And there's ways to finance it so it's cost effective. All right. So first, pedal to the metal on deployment. Second, we have to put the brakes hard on fossil fuel consumption and fossil fuel production because Production is going to follow the need for consumption. The more we use fossil fuels, the longer we perpetuate this global warming problem. So we need to stop using natural gas, oil, and coal wherever there are practical substitutes. Now, kind of looking at this realistically, eh, coal's going away. It's dying just because it's too expensive. We're not using as much oil anymore. That used to be the fuel 30, 40, 50 years ago or longer. It was really convenient. Now we're using mostly natural gas. It's cleaner, but still generates a lot of greenhouse gases. And when I look at this realistically, we're going to continue to use natural gas because there are certain things like long distance transportation, trucks. I mean, we can get away from diesel, but these trucks require a lot of fuel and it's not going to be easy to do that with batteries. It's just not really cost effective. Even in terms of planes, not that cost effective to fly a big plane with batteries because the batteries are heavy and you get to the point of no return where basically in order to get a certain distance, you're going to need more batteries than the plane carry. So long distance transportation is one. And the other big one is industrial processing, kind of obscure, but steel making uses a tremendous amount of energy and it's mostly coal, gas, oil. Industrial process heat, like making cement, uses a tremendous amount of natural gas. So a lot of these processes where you just have to heat things for a long time, or there's some benefits of having the fossil fuel go through the chemicals that you're reacting, you just kind of need it. There's a way around it, and the way around it is to use hydrogen. If you use natural gas to convert into hydrogen, you're actually producing just as much emissions as if you were to use the natural gas to begin with, in some cases more. But if we have green hydrogen, green hydrogen is basically generating hydrogen from electrolyzing water, solar, wind, 
turn it just bubble it through you get hydrogen bubbling up you can capture it we can use that hydrogen for long distance transportation we can use that hydrogen for industrial process heat and that means we stop using these fossil fuels and the third thing we need to do is we need to penalize bad behavior bad to use fossil fuels Carbon tax is a very effective tool to do this, and it gives industries some flexibility. California has been using something called cap and trade. It kind of has a similar impact as carbon taxes. Carbon taxes are more efficient than cap and trade. There's a bureaucracy involved in cap and trade. The big disadvantage of the carbon tax is the tax word. People don't like taxes. As soon as they hear taxes, they'll vote no. So that's how cap and trade got through in California. But you know, globally, we're starting to use carbon taxes everywhere, and we're going to need to do that because that's going to add some extra urgency to people, to industries, to companies to convert away from fossil fuels to something electric. All right. So yeah, here's the thing. I've been kind of looking at this for a long time, five, six, seven years, you know, since Al Gore started talking about we need to solve this global warming problem. There's a lot of interdependencies of these different measures we can use to reduce greenhouse gas. It'll make your head explode. It's relatively easy to come up with lots of good ways to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. I'm not going to go into all the details, but it's tricky to see the impact of all these different mechanisms because they depend on each other. For example, if we put a high tax on carbon, that's going to make fossil fuels more expensive. Does that mean that we don't have to incentivize renewables much? Yeah, maybe. I mean, if we have a really high tax on carbon, companies are going to say, and utilities are going to say, gee, it's better if we just start putting in solar. We don't need as many incentives on solar. So you got to figure out how taxing something means you don't have to tax something else. Or along the same lines, if we're confident that carbon capture and sequestration, CCS, is going to become available in scale in you know, eight to 10 years. Does that mean we can expand our natural gas use? Let's just look at a possibility, remote as it may be, that we invent a way to sequester carbon from burning fossil fuels. And I'm not just talking about pumping it into the ground because it's going to boil out. I'm talking about like turning it into limestone or some kind of mineral that's not going to be emitting again. So if we had a magical way to do that, does that mean we can expand our natural gas use? Or... Another example, if we plant a trillion trees, a trillion trees, there's efforts to do that. Does that mean that we don't need to do anything else? Does that mean we don't even need a carbon tax? Well, you know, these are more interdependencies that are hard to figure out. So basically, there's lots of levers we can use to get to the desired result. The question is, are we pulling the right levers and are we pulling them hard enough? So to figure this out, there's a simulation model that I've used called En-ROADS. I don't know why they call it En-ROADS, but it's really good. I strongly recommend you just go to Google, and you type in En-ROADS, and you fiddle around with this thing. It's pretty self-explanatory. It's done by the Climate Interactive Organization, Vantana Systems, and MIT. And what's really great about this model, it works on any computer, it's easy to change the assumptions on the major drivers of global warming. And then you can kind of see what happens. So you can change our energy supply mix. You can change how we use energy. You can change the economic growth rates. You can change the ways we use our land and what kind of emissions that are happening from industry. We can kind of look at some things like carbon removal technologies, CCS. So I played around with this a lot and it's very highly recommended. And I just kind of said, all right, let's just kind of look at the baseline assumption and then let's try and figure out what some aggressive assumptions are and then see what's going to be more realistic. And along the way, I, I did one more to see if we can get within 1.5 degrees C. All right. So let's start with the baseline simulation that I did. And this baseline simulation, hey, we're going to continue to use fossil fuels for a while. And by the way, this baseline simulation is the default. When you go to En-ROADS, this is where you're going to be. So we're going to continue to use fossil fuels. Nuclear is going to continue. It's not going to grow really fast, but we're going to continue to use nuclear. Yeah, arguably not a bad thing. Wind and solar renewables, and we're talking about renewables. It's wind, it's solar, it's hydro, it's geothermal, but mostly wind and solar. They're going to grow steadily. We don't put a significant carbon tax in place. Transportation and buildings are going to continue to be powered as before with some steady but gradual efficiency improvements. We're not going to make any big changes in land use like you know reforestation, and we're not going to be dramatically changing the industry emissions. And the population of the earth and the economic situation of the earth is going to continue to grow steadily. So our economies are going to continue to grow gradually. 
And the population is going to get, you know, when I kind of look at this, it's going to get to 11 billion people by 2100. So if we start with all these basic assumptions in 2021, the results in the year 2100, it's hard for me to even think about that because I'll be dead by then. But by 2100, there's going to be 11 billion people on Earth. The temperature on Earth is going to increase by 3.6 degrees C. The areas on the Earth that are already hot are going to be uninhabitable. I mean, people will not be able to survive. But once you get to the Fahrenheit temperatures, I just kind of remember these, of about 130 degrees Fahrenheit, you can't live there. Yeah, you could live in a you can live in a house with an air conditioner, but if that air conditioner goes off, you're going to die. And there's going to be a lot more places on Earth that situation is going to happen. And there's going to be massive migration around the Earth. The sea levels are going to rise by 1.1 meters. So all these coastal communities, yeah, if you're 1.1 meters away, you're going to be 1.1 meters more underwater. You're going to have to build dikes. There's going to be a lot of floods. All the coastal areas are going to be flooded. People are going to have to move inland. That's expensive. I mean, you can build seawalls, but 1.1 meters is a lot, and it's going to keep going up from there. But it might have some good benefits. There's going to be farming in areas like Alaska and you know southern Chile. The center of the earth around the equator, it's going to probably become pretty uninhabitable. It's just going to be really, really hot. And it's also going to dramatically change the weather. I'm not going to get into what's happening with the weather. I mean, the weather is hurricanes and things like that happen. But the weather's going to get worse. It's more violent weather because as the air gets warmer, which is we're talking about a 3.6 degree C increase in, in global temperatures, when the air gets warmer... It holds more moisture, and so you get bigger storms, bigger floods, more rain, more snow, things like that. So a lot of changes. On the whole, this kind of change isn't good. There's going to be some places that benefit, but I'd say there's going to be a lot more places that are going to suffer. All right, so that's the first scenario. That's the base. Not really good. 3.6 degrees, and there's been a huge effort to keep it under 1.5 degrees C, and we'll get to that in a sec. All right, now let's consider an aggressive set of assumptions to try and minimize global warming. So from an energy supply standpoint, this is an aggressive set of assumptions. No increase in the use of fossil fuels. Highly subsidized renewables. And, you know, in this simulation, I used a subsidy rate of three cents a kilowatt hour. For wind and solar, that's free. It costs less than three cents a kilowatt hour for a wind and a solar farm. It's different for rooftop, so that's going to help. But highly subsidized renewables. Highly subsidized nuclear. I'm a skeptic about nuclear, but in this scenario, we're trying a lot of things. Seven cents a kilowatt hour to subsidize nuclear. Way more expensive than wind and solar, but you get nighttime power for that. Nuclear's got some disadvantages as far as being dangerous, and there's the nuclear waste issue, things like that. But you get nighttime power, baseload power, so it's valuable. But big subsidy. Now, one of the big downsides is it's currently taking about 20 years or more to build a new nuclear plant in the U.S. So this is the kind of thing that's not going to really take off real soon, whereas renewables are taking off pretty quickly. I mean, it's just growing like crazy. And then the last thing is part of this aggressive set of assumptions is a really high tax on carbon, $249 a ton. Well, right now in the U.S., there's no tax on carbon. There's some places where the tax might be $25 a ton, but in the U.S., no tax on carbon. So we're going to change the energy supply to make it cleaner, less fossil fuels, and we're going to highly incentivize people to get away from carbon with that tax. All right, transportation. Increase the transportation energy efficiency by 4.7% a year. I mean, this is something that's like simple, like the CAFE, Corporate Average Fuel Economy Standards. We're just going to keep pushing that up and up and up. Now, unfortunately, what happens in the U.S. is every time there's a presidential change from one party to another. You know, it goes from a high subsidy to a low subsidy and the automakers are kind of going back and forth. And sometimes they say yes, sometimes they say no. They generally don't like to change. And realistically, if we're making the cars more efficient, they're going to use less gas. It's great, but they're going to be a little bit more expensive. And so when we talk about these energy efficiency improvements in cars, people complain, oh, my car is going to cost $200 more. Obviously, you're going to save like $200 every year on fuel, but that's the political argument. So what we need to do is make that transportation more efficient and electrify almost all road and rail transportation. That's going to be tricky. Rail, yes, we can electrify the rails. Vehicles, cars are pretty easy. Long distance trucking, heavy loads, not really good for electrification yet. Once again, it's kind of the same as planes, not as bad, but it's expensive. 
in terms of energy to haul a really big battery around. But we're starting to see some electric pickups come out and maybe eventually there'll be some things like long distance trucking. Okay. Buildings and industry highly increase the building energy efficiency by 5% a year. That's basically by saying every building has to become more and more efficient by 5% a year. I mean, we just went through big battles with just silly things like light bulbs. Now, LEDs are dramatically more efficient, so that's made a big difference. But by electrifying all the buildings, we're going to save a tremendous amount. And once again, this is one of the things that's it's cost effective. I'm seeing this happen right now on residential and commercial. It makes sense to electrify buildings, certainly on the basis of new buildings, in many cases also on the basis of existing buildings. All right, and then land use and industry emissions. Land use are things like, you know, how we're doing farming, how we're dealing with deforesting areas in Brazil. They need more land, they're cutting down trees, and burning the trees. The, the trees have captured carbon. Now that carbon goes into the air. And then there's also the possibility of, of planting more trees, reforestation. The thing about really reducing deforestation is the population's growing and people want to live somewhere. But in this assumption, we're looking at we're reducing that deforestation rate by 10%. It's doable. Highly reduce methane and other greenhouse gas emissions by 55% a year. When we're drilling for natural gas, there's natural gas that we capture, but a lot of it leaks out. Natural gas is mostly methane, so it leaks. And that methane that leaks into the air, that's actually worse than CO2. There's other industrial process chemicals like CFCs that are used for refrigerants, you know, even methane emissions from cows, cow farts. That's bad. So we're going to try and reduce that by 55% a year. So if we follow that aggressive set of assumptions to minimize global warming, the results in 2100 are the temperatures still going to increase by 1.9 degrees C and the sea levels are going to rise by 0.9 meters. Now, we're not going to get to our goal of limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees C. With an aggressive set, we can get to about 1.9 degrees C. So we talked about a very aggressive set of measures to take to reduce global warming. And these are going to be politically difficult. There's going to be big winners and big losers. Big losers, mostly on the fossil fuel side. Big winners on the renewable side. Net economic effects, I don't think are going to be that big. There's going to be a transfer of wealth from fossil fuel companies to renewable companies. But this is going to be good for the world, good for the climate. But let's see what happens if we're not quite as, as aggressive, if we're more realistic with what's going to happen politically and what's really available from a technical standpoint. So I'm going to call this the moderately aggressive approach. And in this moderately aggressive approach, we're not going to subsidize renewables so much. We're going to subsidize them at two cents a kilowatt hour. That's probably about where we are right now. We're not going to put in any new nuclear it's way too expensive to put in nuclear plants. It takes way too long. The environmental costs are very high. There's technical barriers. And the only big advantage, the only advantage of nuclear is that you've got that baseload nighttime power. And that's something that, you know, what are we going to do about it? Well, there's some not great solutions, but there are some things that we can do about it. We're going to come up with a carbon tax of 50 cents a ton. So it's medium carbon tax. It's not kind of where most of the world is right now around 25. It's not at the 250 that we may need to get to. We're going to more slowly increase transportation energy efficiency and electrification. So not everything all at once, but we're going to more slowly increase that energy efficiency for vehicles by 2.4% and electrify 40% of all new transportation, not all new transportation. We're going to increase building energy efficiency by 2.7% a year and electrify half of the new buildings. Not all the new buildings, half. Uh, California is already making a big effort to electrify every new building, residential and commercial, and that, that's going to happen in California. In the rest of the world, in this scenario, we just want to electrify half of all new buildings. Now, eventually, all the old buildings in our place are going to be gone. There are going to be new buildings, and there's also going to be efforts towards electrifying existing buildings, but we're not going to talk about that in this scenario. In this scenario, we're not talking about any change in population or economic growth. It's very, you know, prohibitive, difficult, virtually impossible to say, oh, we're going to cap the population, or we're going to not pursue rapid economic growth. Every country around the world, every company, every household, they want to increase their economic growth. So to say, uh, no, we're not going to do it, not going to happen. And we're also not going to require any changes in deforestation, which is cutting down trees, or afforestation, which is planting a lot more trees. We're not going to change that. And we're not looking for any big technological breakthroughs. Breakthroughs 
are kind of tempting because you can maybe solve a problem if, if something happens, but if it doesn't happen or if it doesn't work out the way you want, you're kind of in trouble. So we're not looking at any technological breakthroughs. I'm not a big fan of saying, oh, we're going to magically come up with a way to sequester carbon or remove carbon dioxide from the air cost effectively. None of that. So under this realistic technical and political assumption scenario, in 2100, the temperature is going to have increased by 2.8 degrees C and the sea levels are going to rise by one meter. I think this is what's going to happen because any more aggressive than this, politically, it's going to be very, very difficult. So that's kind of what we're in for. That's kind of not great either. I mean, I'd like to see that we can do much better, but that's kind of where I think we're going to be. Now, the goal from the International Climate meetings and commitments are to get to a maximum global temperature increase of 1.5 degrees C. Now, I just went through two scenarios. One's really aggressive and one's kind of realistic and we're not there. So the problem about getting to 1.5 degrees C is really just inertia in terms of the Earth's climate. There's already a lot of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And there's a lot of carbon dioxide locked into the ocean and into the earth. So it's hard to kind of get that out. Now, the stuff that's in the ocean and the earth, the trees, that we could kind of avoid that. But what's in the air is just an enormous amount. And because we're still burning a lot of fossil fuels, we're adding to those levels. We're making it worse. We're continuing to make it worse. We haven't kind of crossed the tipping point where we're getting better. We're still making it worse. So these previous aggressive scenarios... We're trying to limit the amount of greenhouse gas. We have to reverse it. We have to remove what's in the atmosphere. That's going to be tough. Aforestation is one way. Planting a trillion trees. Not a bad idea on paper. Trees take land. You can't take land away from people who are already using that land. You can't go to farmers. You can't go to cities. You can't go to parklands and say, we're going to take that out. And we're going to plant fast growing trees. that are going to sequester carbon. It's not going to work. The only way, in my view, to get to this 1.5 degree C limit, that's something that the whole world has tried to pursue. The only way to get there is with technology to remove carbon dioxide from the air and to dramatically, dramatically increase the tax on carbon to $249 a ton. The problem with the CO2 removal is that the technology, we can do it. But it uses a tremendous amount of energy. In fact, that these little plants that are using more energy in some ways, they're creating more carbon dioxide because of the way this is removed. The only way to do this is you have to have a completely renewable system, solar panels and wind turbines, which is the clearest way to do it, in order to generate enough electricity to kind of suck in the air, pull out the carbon dioxide, and then put it into a form, a, a solid form, that's not going to kind of bubble back up into the air. I'm very skeptical about these efforts. They're going to say, oh, we're going to sequester carbon and we're going to pump it underground and we're going to compress it. Unless you're putting it into limestone or building it into concrete or doing something like that, it's going to get out again. We're not talking about, you know, a 10-year scenario. We're talking about hundreds of years. So only if we were to dramatically develop and scale up this unproven technology that's going to use a tremendous amount of energy can we get to below 1.5 degrees C? You know, the scenario that I ran is if we can go full scale ahead with and deploy as much CO2 removal technology as possible, plus a really big carbon tax, we can get to 1.3 degrees C temperature increase by 2100. We can get below 1.5, but it's not going to happen. The technology is just not there yet. It's just imaginary. Our scenarios by people and politicians and industries that say, oh, we're going to do this. In the meantime, we're going to still burn fossil fuels. We're just making the problem worse. So in many ways, having this illusory mirage of technology out there, and even carbon sequestration is the same way. It's like, we're going to sequester the carbon. We're going to pump it underground. It's going to bubble out. So I'm not a big fan of that. We're kind of looking at we're stuck around 2.8 degrees C. So these scenario analysis also, this tool En-ROADS, also allows you to kind of look at things and see, hey, what about something like this? What about another alternative? When I kind of ran through these things, it's called a sensitivity analysis. A lot of the things that people talk about that we're going to change aren't going to really move the needle significantly in these scenarios, or they're simply impractical. So, I mean, there's the ability to, to look and see what if we use more bioenergy, using algae to convert cellulose into ethanol and then burning the ethanol or lots of wood chips and things like that. Even if we were to highly subsidize bioenergy, 
capturing cow farts and using that. It's only going to reduce the temperature in 2100 by 0.1 degrees C. You know, not enough. If we add nuclear at any realistic rate, because it takes so long to build these plants, it's only going to reduce the temperature by 0.1 degrees C. Now, maybe there's a breakthrough in new nuclear reactor technologies. I've been reading about that for 50 years, but we're not there. It's getting worse. If we were to reduce economic growth by half a percent a year, which is terrible. Nobody's going to say we want the world to go into a recession for 80 years. It's only going to reduce the temperature by 0.2 degrees C. Bad approach and not going to solve the problem. If we stopped deforestation, in other words, told people in the Amazon and all around the world, don't burn down any more trees so you can live there, that's not going to work. It doesn't make enough of a difference. The world's population has got to increase by 4 billion people. Where are they going to be? If we were to plant a trillion trees, that's easier to pronounce it afforestation, that's only going to reduce the global temperature by 0.1 degrees C. And there's not enough land to do that. So that's a non-starter. So here's where I ended up. Because of our 120-year history of using liquid fossil fuels and fossil fuels like coal, and even going back a few hundred years before that when we started using coal and you know, we discovered some oil, We've been doing that for 150 years. The earth is on a path to warm up by 3.6 degrees C. If we really take some aggressive efforts, we can limit that. Aggressive and realistic. Aggressive and realistic efforts. We can limit that warming to 2.8 degrees C. And we can limit the sea level rise to one meter. If, on a worldwide basis, we do these three things, we continue the very rapid deployment of renewables, including wind and solar. Hydro is good, but, you know, it's really hard to find a place to build a dam. It takes forever, and once again, it's using up land that people want to use for other things. So wind and solar are the no-brainers. They're scaling. That's making sense. More, more, more. We need to electrify our buildings. We need to electrify our transportation. And we need to electrify our industries. Now, one way of electrifying industries with process heat is with green hydrogen. And that makes a lot of sense. We'll need more renewables for that. We'll need more wind and solar. Wind is a great way to do it because you can kind of have those windmills cranking and solar is a great way to do it. Basically, you can use green hydrogen to store energy and then you can use that for making steel, for making cement, for industrial processes. Buildings and transportation, pretty easy. We know how to do that with heat pumps, with LED lighting, changing things. And the next thing we need to do is implement a $50 a ton carbon tax. Not as much as in the very aggressive scenario, but certainly within the realm of reality, especially as this global warming crisis gets worse. Now, these conclusions are pretty much consistent with what scientists are saying. We have a lot of work to do to implement these measures. Electrification, renewables, boy, just coming up with the T word for taxes on carbon, that's going to be really hard, but that's the best way to do it. It's the best way to, to force consumers to move away from polluting fossil fuels that are making greenhouse gas worse than pretty much anything else. But people hate the word taxes. Now, luckily, this is where we're kind of getting lucky on some of these measures, especially renewables, electrification, transportation. Luckily, these measures are cost effective. In other words, it's cheaper than continuing to use fossil fuels and dealing with the resulting pollution. It's cheaper to get an EV instead of a gas vehicle. It's cheaper to build a house that's basically all electric than to use a natural gas sources of heat, hot water, and cooking. It's just cheaper. And the numbers are out there. New buildings, once again, it's cheaper. It's cheaper for utilities to generate electricity from solar and wind than to put in fossil fuel plants. So the economic trends are really in our favor. It's just a matter of pushing that a little bit harder and then doing some of the really hard things like implementing carbon taxes. Still, we're at 2.8 degrees C. Imagine you know the sea levels are going to rise by over three feet on a worldwide basis. So everybody that's living near the ocean, all those islands, they're going to have problems, but I don't see any way around it. Okay. That's all the time we have on this week's Energy Show. Thanks to all of our listeners for tuning in. And if you missed any of today's show, you can always go to our website at cinnamon.energy and listen to the podcasts. So, you want to save the world with clean energy? Make money doing it? Confused about the economic and technical realities of residential and commercial solar, batteries, heat pumps, EVs? 
Want the real world scoop on new energy technologies, not manufacture hype? Then tune in to the weekly energy show hosted by Barry Cinnamon. Insights from Barry's 40 plus years in the solar and energy industry will help you understand the future ways we'll generate and consume energy. And now here's Barry.